tonight's Top Gear, not one, but three Mazda 323s. The latest and the winner of our Rally Quest competition. And we join the celebrations for 30 mini years. Hello and welcome to this week's Top Gear. We're going to be spending a fair bit of time this evening talking about Japanese cars and their car industry. So we're at Swindon at the site of the latest Honda transplant. Transplant being the industry's current jargon word to describe a Japanese assembly plant overseas. On this site, Honda have already invested about £60 million in a new uh, engine factory. They're in the process of injecting another £300 million to build an ultra-modern car assembly plant. So by any measurement, it's a big deal. Even though so it's just a tiny fraction of the total amount invested over the past 10 years overseas by the Japanese car industry in the UK and the USA particularly, and now just about one in four cars built anywhere in the world carries a Japanese badge. We're going to start this evening with a road test on one of the latest of them, the new Honda Accord, launched in Frankfurt. Many people thought it was far too conservative. Chris Goff has been driving it. Although almost every part of the latest Honda Accord is new, the car seems very much like an enlarged version of the old model. Wheelbase goes up by five inches and height by an inch and a half. Also inflated is the price. Honda seem to be capitalising on their reputation for quality, reliability and design with a definite move up market for what was their Sierra rival. Although the base model is £12,000, this 2-litre EXI is expected to be the most popular. It's priced at just over 15000 That's nearly 1500 more than the old model. But it's still a bargain compared with the £19,000 top-of-the-range model with four-wheel steering. For Japan, the Accord can be ordered with five cylinders, but all cars sold in Britain are 16-valve fours. The 2-litre injection now gives 133 horsepower, and there are more sophisticated engine mounts for quietness. And headlights are interesting, clear lenses with complex moulded reflectors. As you'd expect, the increase in exterior dimensions has been reflected in the interior, and this new Accord is now a very roomy car indeed. In particular, there's very good headroom, and that's something that the early models were criticised for. In fact, there's even room to use the power seat to uh, take you well up in the world. Rear passengers get lots of legroom. The, the whole cabin gives a, a feeling of quietness and solidity. That's in part due to a new floor construction using a honeycomb structure. And the dashboard is also a new idea. They put the heating and ventilating ducts moulded inside it. And the whole lot is then clamped to the front of the car. And that means there's nothing inside to shake about and rattle. Very high level of standard equipment. You get cruise control, you get air conditioning, you get anti-lock brakes, very nice stereo radio, electric windows as you'd expect, and electrically controlled and heated door mirrors. However, the legendary quality control isn't infallible. In this Japanese-built car, we found one tiny area of poor paint finish already going rusty. Despite that, the new car is most impressive. Handling is tidy, but more noticeable is the improvement in the ride, which could be rather coarse on the old car. Performance is excellent and delivered with great smoothness. The car remains quiet up to very high speeds, and the engine readily spins round to high revs with absolutely no fuss. Honda have also developed their speed-sensitive power steering system to remove its tendency to become over light at lower speeds or over heavy after braking. At Cavalier prices, the Honda Accord was always a strong competitor in its market sector. But is it up to competing with cars like BMW's 520i? Well, one Honda dealer we spoke to maintains that the people who bought their first Accord five years ago are now that much better off, and he thinks they'll stick to the car they value so much. Well, back here at Swindon, Honda can't, of course, on any international scale be reckoned as a major manufacturer, but they've already earned themselves a reputation for being ruthlessly competitive. In motorsport, for example, so the saying goes, whatever Honda wants, Honda gets. In the States, they're already the number one Japanese seller here in the UK. They've bought themselves a 20% slice of Rover. In fact, these concertos are built at Longbridge. They come off the line with a Honda badge on. They come down here to Swindon for their pre-sale quality inspection. They expect within four years to have 100,000 new Honda cars rolling out of this plant here for sale in the UK and on the continent. And that's just the final lady, of course, in a wave of Japanese investment spread right across the UK. 
Nissan were first. Their plant in Sunderland opened in 1986 and will produce 200,000 cars a year by 1993, employing 3,500 people. Its product, the Bluebird, is now superseded in Japan, but exports to continental Europe have already started, and the new Bluebird and Micra are promised. Toyota were next. They intend to make a replacement for this car, the Carina, at a plant in Derbyshire by the early 90s. Engines will come from another Toyota plant at Shotton on Dee's side. Honda, however, chose a different route. They chose to collaborate with Rover. Rover gained new designs to adapt and build in their own plants. Honda had the security of a partner in what was just as important, an assured market for their components. The engines from the plant here at Swindon currently supply the production line at Longbridge, where they go into the Concerto, as well as into some versions of the system model, the new Rover 200. Eventually, of course, they will also supply Honda's own assembly plant here. But aren't the production volumes of around 100,000 cars a year rather small for a modern assembly plant? Have the Japanese revealed their entire hand? They traditionally take a step-by-step -step approach. They put in a small investment, they make 100,000 cars, then they take another step and make it 200,000, then they make another plant, and eventually they produce something like 500,000 cars. And I think the same pattern will happen in the UK. But remember that the Japanese always like to understate what they're going to do. And therefore, if they say they're going to make 100,000 cars in Honda's plant in Swindon, then you can be quite assured that that is the absolute minimum. Honda's track record in America shows what may be in store for Britain. Honda have four transplants there, away from the old industrial centers with all their deeply rooted problems. Already, American boat Hondas, like this Accord Coupe, are actually being exported back to Japan. The other Japanese companies too have American transplants, raising the Japanese share of the American market to fully 25%. Back in Europe, the new Japanese offensive is undoubtedly causing concern among the established European makers. There's a feeling that the British government has only welcomed the Japanese because of the relative weakness of Britain's domestic car industry. And if the degree of commonality between the new Honda Concerto and Rover 200 is anything to go by, could Rover lose its ability to develop independent designs? I think increasingly Rover has to uh, depend on Honda for its design and its development work. That doesn't mean that Rover won't have a contribution to make. It certainly will. But in order to compete effectively in the marketplace, it has to plug into the economies of scale of a larger manufacturer. And therefore, the Rover Group will increasingly be making Honda designs. Rover might hotly dispute that, but the proof of the pudding, perhaps, is in the new Rover 200, which is launched this week. We test it in next week's programme. Now, from the concerns of the present to a celebration of the past, namely Rover's continuing celebration of the Mini. Its 30th birthday party was held this summer and Becky Adam was invited along. 120,000 people and 25,000 minis converged on Silverstone for what must have been the biggest gathering ever to pay homage to a single mark. They were here to celebrate the minis 30th birthday, the little car that revolutionised 60s motoring. Within six years of its introduction in 1959, a million people had bought one and the enthusiasm continues unabated. At Silverstone, mini clubs mushroomed, arriving from all parts of the country. They were joined by old and young alike from all corners of the world. Mini appeal has spread across generations as well as the globe. This neat little continental model is certainly easy to park, and the modifications were completed in an afternoon. All enthusiasts seem to agree that small is definitely beautiful. It was very far ahead of its time. I don't think there's any car that's 30 years old today it's as nice to drive as the Mini was, so and still is. Japanese car is a, so complicated, many things working by electric. But Mini is uh, very simple. Actually, I got addicted to them because my husband was addicted to them. It's just a disease that we have. They're just so cute, everybody gets attached to them. They're like a pet you like to hug and take home. <laughs> I used to call my car Min. Min 1, Min 2, Min 3, Min 4. Min 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 and 10. By 80, I should be on to min number 29. 29 mins, folks, at nearly an hour. 
Everyone remembers those early minis with an 850cc engine, 10-inch wheels, one at each corner, and those famous pull-string doors. They sold for under 500 pounds. Later changes in design included a radically different front end on Mini Clubman's for 1969 and on the 1275 GT. Initially, Mini sales were slow as people got used to this odd little car, but the craze soon caught on. It took a, a while to, to get underway because the car was so unusual and people had to get used to this idea of a car designed to look small but be big inside, to have a transverse engine and where you were sat much nearer the front than normally you would be. And once people accepted the idea that this car could perform, that this car had style, that this car had economy, and this car was safe, then the whole thing started to ban it, and it's never looked back from there. Many attempts at mini derivatives were stopped at the prototype stage. This one, designed by Michelotti, was an early attempt at something sporty. You can see why it never made production. The Mini's birthday celebrations certainly weren't just a time for serious admiration of museum pieces. The occasion was a weekend of fun, often very energetic for club enthusiasts. This group of American Mini owners, and yes, they're into them too, travelled over 5,000 miles to release some surplus energy and join in the fun. And the Minis came in all shapes and sizes, proving that smaller isn't necessarily better, larger appears to be even worse, and some don't even bear talking about. It appears Izigonis got it right first time. John Cooper was the man who persuaded BMC to let him develop the first hot Mini. All the racing boys had Minis when they first came out, and I thought it was about time they put more power into it. And I went to see Izigonis, and we went to see George Harriman and he said take one away and do it. We took one away and put one of our racing engines in the car, disc brakes, and took it back and he thought it was fantastic. And I said, uh, you've got to build a thousand of them to get it homologated. He said, we'll never sell a thousand. Anyway, they sold 150,000 in the end. And Cooper are still in business. You supply the 1989 model and they supply the boost in performance from 43 to 64 HP, plus a new grill and set of alloy wheels. It may not be the original Cooper S, but it's quick, unleaded, and perfect for today's traffic, and I want one. The ERA turbocharged version comes with a modified A-series engine, upgraded front and rear suspension, and improved brakes. For around £12,000, you get a Mini that does 0 to 60 in 7.8 seconds, with a claimed top speed of 115. That's not too bad, and the car would probably appeal to the new enthusiast. British racing automobiles have developed this supercharged 1300cc limited edition. It has a sumptuous hide interior and performance is comparable with the ERA Mini. But with the dubious body kit and a horrendous price tag of £30,000, this one's surely destined for export. This 1959 prototype failed the army's tests, so they sold it as the Moke and it passed with flying colours. Now, 30 years on, we're all here celebrating this historic occasion and the world's biggest mini traffic jam. 5,000 cars stretching as far as the eye can see. Izagonis would have been proud. Little car, happy birthday. What a birthday treat, it's excellent. See you later. Now, given the theme of tonight's programme, it's worth underlining perhaps the Mini is one of the few British cars to go down a bundle in Japan. They really loved it. Now, apart from their success with cars, the Japanese have had several fruitful collaborations to produce light vans like these. General Motors went in with Suzuki to produce the Rascal here and with the Suzu to turn out the Midi. They're now selling several thousand of these every year in the UK and continental Europe. The big gap so far has really been with big trucks. The name Hino isn't instantly recognisable in this country. We're more used to familiar European truck names looming large in our rearview mirrors. But Hino is number two truck maker in the world. And the chances are that if you go to a construction site, you'll see some Hino trucks. The reason, well, there's a sudden growth in the construction industry and the demand for eight wheelers couldn't be met by the European manufacturers. So operators went for these Japanese trucks, currently assembled in Ireland, complete with chrome grills and roof lights. 
So why did the operators like these trucks when in the first place they were available off the peg? They also liked the simplicity and the ruggedness of the truck. It's got a floor made of lino. Now, European truck manufacturers might scoff at that, but the lads up on the sites will tell you it means you can hose them out at the end of a muddy day and they're ready for work the next morning. On the mechanical side, they weren't too happy about the fuel consumption. Now, this is a, a naturally aspirated 13 and a quarter litre six-cylinder engine. Modern European trucks tend to be turbocharged and intercooled, and that means they're a little bit more economical. Of course, Hino say they're also more liable to break down, and with standing charges of around 150 pounds a day for a rig like this before you even start it up, days off the road are absolutely critical. At £49,000, it's good value, and there are plans to assemble a full range of vehicles in the UK soon. The Hino is uh, a very easy vehicle to drive. It's quiet, the steering is light, it's very easy to manoeuvre in confined spaces, and the Japanese have applied their car expertise in switchgear instruments and gear changing to a truck. Europeans say there's nothing to fear from Hino, but haven't we heard that line before about motorbikes and cars? Right, from trucks to rallying, because Rally Quest is back for the second time. Rally Quest, you may remember, is the competition we run together with the Radio Times to select someone to take part in the Lombard RAC Rally. Winner this year is Liz Jeffries from Brackley, Northamptonshire. She's done so well in the qualifying rallies since. She's now got her international licence, will definitely take part in the Lombard RAC. Tony Mason went to see how she was coping with the pressure. When Liz won from the thousands of RallyQuest entries back in the spring, she was somewhat surprised, if not flabbergasted. Tell me, Liz, what did you do after you won RallyQuest? Well, I panicked for a while. Then um, I came home, and when I sort of realised what I'd actually won, I was very excited. So how's it affected your day-to-day -day life? Well, obviously, um, doing these rallies, I've had to have a fair bit of time off. Um, luckily, as I'm a self-employed farm secretary, I can work a bit harder the week before and make up the time, and then I can have the odd day off. What I do is I travel round, visiting various farms. Um, I do anything from bookkeeping, VAT, wages. There's one place I go where we have a computer that we keep all our health and fertility records, and I also draw calves there. Draw them? Well, don't actually draw them. We have a sketch card and we have to fill the black and white bits in. And that's for pedigree, so then we can actually recognise them. Well, that's a far cry from the infamous Kielder Forest in the borders where Liz competed in August. Unfortunately, she went off on a bend in the early stages and had to leg it for help. Although she got going again, she ran out of time. Perhaps some extra tuition wouldn't go amiss, so who better than top rally driver Louise Aitken Walker to give her some help? Oh. Hello. Hi Liz. Why don't we go for the lesson? I think we all think I need one. Is that okay with you? Yes, that's <laughs> fine. Well, I last met her. <laughs> oh, who's this? The bank? This is, um, this belongs to Chris, my husband. Uh-huh. That's his former motorsport. He leaves all the rally into me. Oh, good. And how's your confidence building up anyway? Uh, little by little, it's gaining each time I do another rally. And how's the, how do you feel the driving's going? Um, I've got a lot more, you know, I think I can handle it a bit better now. I've got a bigger engine, so it goes a bit faster. How are you going to attack the RAC? Well, after not finishing on the Cumbria, I realise how disappointing it is not to finish one. So I think we'll take it a bit steady for the first couple of days and then see how it goes. I'm just praying it doesn't snow or rain or, mm. or be icy. Well, come on, we'll go and have a practice anyway. Right, OK. <laughs> I've never, um, never really had a chance to have a good practice at them, but this is nice and flat and no trees, so... So here's the bollard up here. We'll keep it in first gear, because that'll be fast enough to do it. So you swing it that way and then turn it round, pull the handbrake on, accelerator, so it'll pull it out. Don't put your foot on the clutch when you're doing a handbrake turn. So are you enjoying all this attention? 
It's great, never had so much notice taken of me for ages. <laughs> what I'm going to do here is take you through some ace bins and hopefully it's going to be effortless to steer the car because you're going to have the car that well balanced yep. that it's going to manoeuvre itself near enough. Okay, so we'll just try this and see what you think. What gate will you start? You start first. No, I'll be in second. Now the roles are reversed with Liz at the wheel and Louise as passenger. Keep that foot up and watch! Good lads, up, up! Keep it going, keep it going! That's it! Shot jabs! In! That way! Feel as though your seat is the car! I often feel the car's driving me and not I'm driving it, but. Good to take the car with a scrub of the neck and you're the boss. It's a bit like a horse. So, what do you think of Louise as an instructor? She's really good. I've learnt a lot. Great. Well, we'll be watching you put it into practice on the next event. Right. Of course, the car Liz drives is a 1300 model with 108 brake horsepower. Louise's, on the other hand, is a 2-litre model and produces 210 horsepower. Come on, Louise. <laughs> We shall, of course, be following Liz's progress as part of our build-up to the big rally in November. Now, part of the Western response to the Japanese onslaught on the international car market has been to follow the principle, if you can't beat them, join them. So, for example, we have General Motors buying into Isuzu and Ford of America buying fully 25% of Mazda. So when Mazda redesigned their major medium-sized contender, the 323, it wasn't entirely inappropriate they should choose America to reveal it to the press. Thus it was that two weeks ago I had the opportunity to drive the new car. The European car makers are under increasing pressure from the Japanese in their continued pursuit of excellence. The mid-sized Mazda 323 is no exception. A new range with an old name or number. It's made up of a three-door hatchback, a four-door saloon, and this five-door coupe. Or is it a hatchback or even a fastback? Of course, one man's fastback is another man's coupe, but certainly the tide seems to have turned against the stream of boringly uh, similar hatchbacks we've had over the past few years towards this uh, somewhat neglected form. As for the looks of this particular car, well, they grow on you with increasing familiarity. It looks good from most angles, from the uh, low front end, complete with sporty pop-up headlamps, to the nicely handled, emphatically rounded rear end. Moves well with its 16-valve engine, nothing uh, sort of heart-searching or stomach-churning, but a crisp 0-6 in 8.2 seconds, top speed 125 miles an hour, although it's going to do that kind of speed with the family on board, I can't imagine. It's also uh, remarkably quiet, even at speed on these bumpy mountain roads, because they've managed to knock out a lot of the uh, wheel rumble you get. shapes themselves. For example, they've managed to achieve a 40% improvement in torsional stiffness and therefore better road holding and handling by beefing up the door sill sections and the front and rear cross members. The uh, fit and finish or the build quality as they say is a very high standard indeed. So too is this paint finish. They claim to have designed a, a new way of putting on the paint that gives them this near Mercedes like uh, paint job. Five doors rather than three, important that I think in a family car. I wonder how long before Vauxhall for example brings out a five door Calibra. The back end, shades of the Sierra XR 4x4 and the Celica. That's perhaps because the wind tunnel, of course, doesn't know a Mazda from a Mars bar. As for the boot itself, well, I think somewhat disappointing. Couldn't get more than a couple of suitcases in there. 
Inside, the overall effect is sporting, but uh, spartan with the chunky gear lever and the instruments in a binnacle behind the steering wheel. Very functional, plenty of legroom in the front, adequate in the back, provided you haven't got ostrich legs, and a very high specification from the tinted glass and the electric sunroof to the central door locking. And that really is the strength of the other two cars in the range. This is the middle of the range, the classic four-door family saloon. Totally unexciting in terms of design, but once again, a very carefully put together, very competitive package of performance in terms of the 16-valve engine, interior space, and its very high specification. Finally, the bottom of the range, the 1.3-litre three-door hatchback, comes in a 1.8-litre form as well, with a performance very similar to that of the GT, uh, very similar in appearance to the uh, Peugeot 205, but larger, of course, more space, more legroom, more headroom than either the Golf, or the Civic, and once again, very highly specified. They believe this will be the best seller of the lot. As to drivability, will all the models benefit from the stiffening up of the chassis and the redesign of the suspension? The uh, power-assisted rack and pinion steering is nicely precise. What would I carp against? Well, the uh, so-called sports seats on this model are nothing special. The interiors, although they use the space very well, uh, are rather unexciting. And the acceleration on this GT version, when you put your foot hard down in fourth, say, is uh, somewhat underwhelming. But that having been said, it feels tight and steady. It doesn't skip around, even on these bumpy mountain roads. It doesn't uh, wander from the line. And I would say that the undoubtedly first-class engineering of these cars and their very high specification will put Mazda very well back in the front row. Well, that's about it for this evening. We can't leave Honda without at least a mention of their motorsports prowess. For the past four years or more, Honda engines have dominated Formula One racing. For the past two years, they've powered the McLaren team to victory in all but a couple of the Formula One Grand Prix. Well, you've got to be tough to be at the top. That's a level of reliability, not to mention power that Ferrari and all the rest would give their eye teeth for. Well, that's it. Next week, we've got all the stars of Motor Fair. We road test the new Jaguar 4 litre and the Rover 200. We look at the behind-the-scenes preparation of a racing Porsche. So see you then. Until then, drive safely. Good night. <laughs>